Don't you just hate it when your niece slash go-to source of affordable childcare dies of a bury-faced case of early onset cardiac arrest? And your sister expects you to unravel the mystery just because you're the investigative journalist of the family? Whenever there's an enigmatic episode involving girls in mental institutions, horse breeders, infertility, spirit photography, and secluded islands off the Pacific Northwest, it seems like that burden falls squarely on your shoulders. What about your brother? What's he doing? He never even brings a dish to the Christmas potluck. But no, it's gotta be you that travels further and further down the rabbit hole until you find yourself literally trapped in the bottom of a well, buried under the floorboards of the local no-tell motel for teens. I hate it when that happens. But never fear, the movie logic expert is here to make sure you don't die in seven days if you find yourself in the ring. There are a lot of bad omens out there right away, just to make it obvious that you're now in a horror film. Right off the bat, we're treated to a spooky version of the DreamWorks logo, complete with video glitches. Now, we doubt you're watching this on VHS tape, but even if you are, no need to give that VCR a hard slap. We're just setting the mood. The second warning also comes before anything even happens in the film, and that is, everything is tinted a sickly shade of green. If you get up in the morning and everything has a slightly nauseating color temperature, you must be at the ready for some ghostly stuff to go down, or for Morpheus to offer you a pill, or maybe your roommate just slipped some food coloring into your contact lens case again. So on a rainy night in Seattle, also known as any night in Seattle, Katie and Becca are discussing normal teenage girl stuff the EM spectrum, and the vast global conspiracy of companies bombarding your brain cells with electrowaves. This naturally leads to talking about the local legend of a cursed videotape. Supposedly, if you watch the tape, a nearby phone will ring, and an unfriendly ghost will be on the other end, who informs you that you have seven days to live. Right now, a lot of millennials are breathing a sigh of relief, as the Gen Z kids just say, huh? since you probably think you're safe, seeing as you won't encounter a VCR, CRT, or home telephone in your life, unless you're visiting grandma for the weekend. Katie informs Becca that she herself has actually seen the tape, and wouldn't you know it, she watched the tape exactly seven days ago. Katie then convincingly pretends to die. This is another sure sign that you're in a horror movie and that you need to get out ASAP. If your friend's performance of their unexpected demise is at all realistic, you can bet that someone will be dying for real soon, and it might be you. Later on, the phone rings and Becca repays Katie's betrayal by pretending that there's a ghost on the other end of the line, when it is, in fact, her mother. But the joke was on Becca. Katie would rather talk to the ghost. Eventually, these games of crying wolf catch up to the young women as the television turns on by itself but there's no creepy imagery, only static. Katie turns the TV off, but it somehow turns back on again. Here, Katie makes the wise decision to unplug the TV. Static isn't a thing that you really see from televisions anymore, or on the ground either. Thanks, global warming. But I suppose it's less scary to see a ghost girl crawl out of a nice photo of a landscape that reads HDMI 4, no input. Katie is still suspicious of Becca, but grows increasingly afraid as the ghost helps itself to a snack from the refrigerator, overflows the bathtub, and eventually, well, we don't know exactly what happened yet, but based on the split-second look we get at her face, we know it isn't good. Here's a helpful movie logic hint. If more than one of your household appliances is misbehaving in a preternatural manner, walk over to a neighbor's house. Best case scenario, the ghost doesn't follow you. Worst case scenario, your death is witnessed by Mr. and Mrs. Klimowitz and is less of a mystery for your aunt or other more distant family to unravel. You can call Becca from their house as you sit down to watch Wheel of Fortune together. Now, we finally get to meet our protagonist, Rachel Keller, as she argues with somebody over the phone before having an awkward parent-teacher conference about her young son Aiden's creepy death-related drawings. Rachel says that his cousin, who was also his best friend, died three days ago, so it's understandable if he's coping by making a couple of weird drawings. 
but the teacher reveals that Aiden drew these last week. Now, this film came out three years after The Sixth Sense, so all serious horror movies were expected to be PG-13 ghost stories with creepy kids. Congress even passed a law that every film had to have at least one spooky child who could either see ghosts, was a ghost, or a combination of the two. Luckily, the Supreme Court later struck that one down as unconstitutional in U.S. v. Shyamalan. Fun fact time! David Dorfman, who plays the young Aiden, went on to enroll in Harvard Law at age 18, and at last check was serving as legal counsel, U.S. House of Representatives, ranking member of Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asia. So, uh, what have I been doing with my life? Rachel checks in on Aiden, who is in his bed, thinking about death. You know, standard second grader stuff. Aiden tells Rachel that his cousin, now confirmed to be Katie from the opening scene, knew precisely which day she was going to die, which raises the question, what high school girl uses an eight-year-old as her main confidant? And furthermore, why is Katie hanging out with her friend watching TV when she's convinced that she's gonna die that night? Anyway, there's a lot of red flags popping up that lead me to think that maybe Aiden ought to be seeing some kind of licensed professional. Not you, Malcolm. We move on to Katie's after-funeral party at the house from the beginning of the movie. Her mother reveals that Katie's heart stopped mysteriously, and we, the viewers, are given a glimpse of Katie's twisted death face. Rachel doesn't get to see this, so we can't dock her points for starting this investigation, despite the fact that this is an obvious case of death by ghost. Rachel is pressured into investigating the death of her niece by her sister, because her job is asking questions. That's right. Our main character is a newspaper journalist who can afford a nice home and babysitters anytime she wants. Like VCRs, big CRT TVs, and landlines, this is another thing that dates the movie. Using her keen reporter instincts, Rachel interviews a group of teens hanging out in the yard. She infiltrates the group, talking about how much she likes having boyfriends and being wild, just like them. The teens tell her about the evil VHS tape, that Katie has a boyfriend, and that this secret boyfriend also died recently, on the same night as Katie. Hey, wait a second, that's the guy from Ready or Not. I guess he likes working with Samaras. Rachel goes into Katie's room and finds out that Katie has been blacking out faces in her pictures, which is honestly not that off-brand for a teenager. She also finds our next dated plot device, a receipt for the development of a roll of film. Ask your parents about that one, kids. Rachel develops the film and finds that some of the photos have distorted faces. She then finds out from a newspaper that two more of Katie's friends also died mysteriously at the same day and time as Katie. Wait, hold on. Multiple teenagers who knew each other died mysteriously at the same time and only one newspaper lady is investigating this? Here's where you gather up the local scientists to compare autopsy notes of the four dead bodies. You don't need to know the ghost's motivation for killing so much as their methods. Maybe Samara's connection to televisions and phone lines means that electricity is involved in some way, and you can avoid her wrath by spending day seven in a Faraday cage. We're not saying for sure that this'll work, but when you've got a dead teen cluster, it's worth getting a second opinion. Next, Rachel is off to the place where Katie watched the evil VHS, which essentially amounts to a cabin in the woods. If you're watching a video on how to survive horror films, you should already know well enough to stay away from anything that resembles cabins in the woods. At the friendly, definitely not murderous lodge, Rachel talks to a store brand Kevin Bacon who's there to perform card magic and deliver exposition. He's better at the second. He explains that there's bad TV reception out there in his various cabins in the woods, so they provide a little library of VHS tapes. One star on the TripAdvisor rating docked for creepy cabins. One star given back for a charming collection of secondhand tapes. Rachel puts two and two together and quickly finds an unmarked tape, swiping it while Tofu Bacon looks away. This is a horror movie no-no. Rachel steals a tape from someone who would have clearly just given it to her, then lies about his magic trick being good. If you have an inclination that you're in a horror movie, 
we ask that you refrain from breaking any of the Ten Commandments, as it just makes the baddies angrier with you. Rachel goes to the evil Cabin 12, since Cabin 13 would have been too on the nose. Being a smart lady, and knowing that no fewer than four kids who've watched the tape died seven days later, what does she do? She watches the tape. She was even warned by a creepy non-tape montage before watching the creepy taped montage. Okay, so this one is kind of a gimme, but if there's a rumor about a malevolent tape that kills you seven days after watching it, maybe don't watch it? Maybe instead, break the tape, sabotage the VCR in cabin 12, and treat yourself to a frosty chocolate milkshake. But the movie has to happen, so of course Rachel watches the tape, sitting inches away from the screen. Didn't anyone tell you that would ruin your eyesight, Rachel? What she sees is a bizarre experimental film, starting with the titular ring imagery. This is followed by a whole cavalcade of weird shots, like an old-fashioned woman brushing her hair, gloomy landscapes, piles of maggots, someone impaling their own finger on a nail. You know, normal stuff. The tape ends on a shot of well before cutting to static, leaving Rachel confused. And rightfully so, but she's even more confused when the phone starts ringing immediately after. Creepy. Even more creepy is what she hears on the other end of the line. It's a child's voice, and it whispers two words to her. Seven days. Rachel books it out of the cabin, but there's no one around, so she heads home and shows her ex, Noah, that her digital camera can no longer take a clear photo of her head. She has the worst case of blurry face this side of 21 Pilots, and she's feeling stressed out. So, naturally, Rachel lets Noah watch the haunted tape, too. I once again propose not doing that thing. Remember the tape smashing idea? Even if you messed up the first time and parked yourself a foot in front of the TV to watch the haunted tape, don't make the same mistake twice, and definitely don't bring other people into your cycle of bad decisions. The phone rings, and Rachel doesn't pick up. Then she deletes the ghost's message from the answering machine. We're not sure if this was Rachel's intention, but we here at Movie Logic find this a solid attempt at throwing the ghost off her rhythm. Though it would have been fun to see the ghost acting like a spurned ex and just calling again. And again, and again, and again. Rachel goes to the AV department of her office to re-watch this pre-YouTube version of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, and for some reason, decides to make a copy of the tape. We'll learn later that this was actually a good idea, but in the moment, it still feels like Dr. Bad Plan to me. In the course of copying the tape, she notices that the evil VHS has turned the tape machine's numbers into the predator language. This is also a red flag, but honestly, not a huge one, as my mother had a microwave that did that same thing. Rachel shows the copy of the tape to Noah, and this VCR is also converted to predator language mode. Just then, Noah's assistant with benefits shows up. Hey, it's Abby from NCIS, your grandma's favorite goth. Rachel's in the middle of a ghost murder tape investigation, though, and doesn't have time for whatever relationship drama is starting to happen here. So she sees herself out of this industrial artist's loft that everyone seems to have in movies like these. Don't get me started on the logic of how this guy's supposed to afford something that big in the middle of Seattle. Not troubled by the real estate question, Rachel goes to visit Becca in the mental institution. Remember Becca? She's the one whose friend died in the opening scenes. Rachel decides her grieving period has gone on long enough and proceeds to harass this traumatized child for more information about the horrible death she recently witnessed. But the only information Becca can give her is to wait four days and then she'll see for herself. But how does Becca know that Rachel even watched the tape? Once again, creepy. Rachel goes to the AV department of the newspaper she works at to watch the tape some more. She just can't get enough of it. It's her new favorite movie. She likes it so much that she even prints out a few stills. While pausing the tape, she notices something though. There's movement. It's a fly on the video, but it didn't pause with the rest of the tape. She's able to grab the fly and physically pull it out from the monitor. 
If a weird trans-dimensional fly wasn't bad enough, she gets a psychic nosebleed for her trouble. These series of red flags only encourage Rachel to continue her investigation. At this point, no one involved seems particularly skeptical of ghosts, spirit photography, or psychic children. In the business we call psychic children, small mediums, by the way. It stands to reason that there's an experienced person in this version of Seattle that has dealt with something like this before. Get to the Yellow Pages! Gen Z kids, the Yellow Pages are… well, never mind. Hey, I'm just as skeptical about these kinds of things as anyone, but at this point, can you really argue that you're in the middle of an honest-to-goodness ghost story? Seek out a shaman, a witch, a warlock, anything. Anyone who has experience with the spirit world is going to be a better partner to help figure this out than a photographer. But Rachel is still convinced that she's the one to bust this ghost problem, and goes to the archives to research the lighthouse from the evil VHS, which is where we get our backstory about the lighthouse's location, Mosque Island. It's a place full of mystery, hallucinations, family secrets, and horse death. But we hear the summers there are lovely. Rachel finds that she's now scribbling out faces too. Whatever has a hold of her, it's getting worse. And the same is true for Noah, who sees in a bodega security camera that he's got a case of blurry faceitis too. Meanwhile, Rachel has a nightmare about a wet telephone and coughing up a hairball with a pasty attached, waking up to find that while she was sleeping on the job, Aiden has watched the evil VHS. So, just to recap, Rachel's investigation has now endangered the lives of everyone she loves, all because she can't be trusted to keep a video cassette in a safe place or keep her VCR unplugged. This is what happens when you pal around with a Naomi Watts character, people. 21 grams? Her family gets run over. The impossible? A tsunami hits her family. Mulholland Drive? Well, that's a whole other video. But the point is that the power of the death energy surrounding Naomi Watts is strong. It even killed King Kong. Not even Godzilla could do that. It's day six now. The clock is ticking. While Noah investigates the hospital where Samara had been a patient, Rachel boards the ferry to the mysterious island of equine death. While on the boat, she spooks a horse so much that it breaks free and runs right off the boat, leading to one of the more famous horse versus boat propeller scenes in the history of cinema. But Rachel seems undaunted by this totally normal experience and continues on her quest. Is this what all journalists are like? Is this why Lois Lane has been kidnapped so many times? Rachel snoops around a creepy stable where she's confronted by Richard Morgan, husband of Anna Morgan, the now deceased woman who was brushing her hair in the cursed VHS tape. Rachel asks Richard if he wants to watch this cool tape she found. For real, Rachel? Why do you keep on siding with the malevolent video cassette? Stop it. Get some help. After a few HIPAA infractions by Noah and some psychic insight by Aiden, we discover the backstory to the movie. Anna Morgan wanted to have a baby, but kept on having medical complications. Eventually, she and her husband Richard take a trip off their island and come back with some baby that they found and live happily ever after. Oh, no, wait. The baby, whom they name Samara, has some sort of psychic powers which cause her mom to hallucinate. So they, naturally, send her to live in a barn, where she causes her father's horses to go nuts. This was the 1970s, so Lexapro for horses was still years away. They send Samara to be studied by some scientists, who make her draw pictures of rocking horses on their x-ray machines, and maybe give her some electroshock therapy. The questionable therapy doesn't seem to work for Samara. So Anna suffocates her daughter with a plastic bag and throws her down a well. Okay, so Rachel finds some of this stuff out later, but we'll lump it all here in one big exposition dump. Now, I, the movie logic expert, am against the murder of children. I feel pretty comfortable taking that bold political stance. However, in a movie, sometimes killing a creepy kid is the right way to go. It certainly would have helped the people of Brightburn and the people of Peaksville, Ohio. But on the other hand, 
This movie clearly demonstrates the possible side effects of violently murdering a psychic child. Really, prevention is the best way here. When adopting a child, check the family history. It doesn't take that much longer to see if your prospective progeny were the spawn of the devil, fathered by an angry sea god, or the bastard son of a thousand murderers. Or you could just get a dog. Not everyone needs to be a parent, after all. Or on second thought, maybe not. Richard wallops Rachel in the head before taking a bath with his favorite appliances, and Rachel's investigation is back to square one. Literally, Noah and Rachel go back to Cabin 12 on Shelter Mountain, which is thankfully vacant. Noah trashes the room Charles Foster Kane style, before taking an axe to the floor, where we discover Samara's well. Finally, the source of all this ghost business. It's never explicitly said, but apparently, the VCR was close enough for her ghost powers to burn the haunted image on the video home system cassette. I wonder if this had happened a few years earlier, if teens would have started passing around a haunted laser disc. Then, <sighs> these two dummies lean over the wicked well multiple times until Samara decides to go full-on Final Destination and throw Rachel into the well via Rube Goldberg device. I cannot stress this enough, people. If you aren't going to anchor yourself with a proper carabiner, please keep your center of gravity low when dealing with a haunted well. You never know what elaborate series of circumstances are going to be set in motion that end with you getting knocked over the edge. So, in most situations, it's best just to keep a lid on the well altogether. Rachel somehow survives this plummet into the well, and she discovers Samara's body. Perhaps even more disturbing, though, are the signs that Samara survived her plastic bagging and managed to stay alive in the well. And you'll never guess how many days she was down there. Oh, wait, you say you did guess? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Seven days. Importantly, these seven days inspired her, as an artist of death, to also let people live seven days before she murders them. It's an homage. Eventually, Rachel and Samara's body are baby jessica out of the well, and Samara's body is finally given a proper burial. After all, that's all this poor, misunderstood ghost girl ever wanted. And then they live happily ever after. Except, no. This is a horror movie. Never believe the first happy ending. Rachel thinks this means the end of the ghostishness, but Aiden, who has been communing with Samara this whole time, says, nah. In one of the creepier moments of the entire film, this too wise for his years child asks his mother, stone faced, why did you help her? Didn't you know she was evil? What with all the children and horses she killed? Oh, right, those. Rachel realizes that she might have done a dumb, and rushes off to Noah, endangering countless citizens with her reckless driving. While she's still on her way, we get the iconic scene of Samara crawling out of the television in all her ghostly glory, tracking water on Noah's hardwood floors as she does that always scary, slow, then really, really fast movement thing. Rachel finally arrives, but she's too late. Samara has given Noah permanent blurry face. Being the hero of the film, Rachel pieces out, leaving Noah's body there to traumatize Abby from NCIS. Rachel drives home, yells at her son for no reason, then proceeds to smash and burn the VHS, which, had she done at the start of this movie, would have saved us all about two hours of runtime. Then, Rachel finds the tape copy that she made earlier in the film. Aha! Rachel jumps to the conclusion that she survived because she made a copy of the film and had people watch it. So she decides the best way to save her son's life is to make a copy of the copy and show it to more people. The movie also implies that we are those people. Thanks a lot, Rachel. Sequels, manga, original source material aside, there isn't really definitive evidence that showing a copy of the malicious found footage montage is what saved Rachel's life. We here at Movie Logic demand rigorous proof for such extraordinary claims. 
But then again, we wouldn't have haphazardly watched the tape to begin with, so... You're probably asking, what else could Rachel have done other than not watch the tape and ignore the mystery? Science. You see, when faced with the choice to do anything that's alleged to kill you in a week's time, I find it best to not do that thing. Rachel should have, upon finding the tape, take it to a laboratory-style setting. Start by showing the footage to mice and examining its effects. Eventually move up to monkeys and, subsequently, higher-order primates. Through peer-reviewed, extensive animal testing, we should be able to find a proper remedy for these ghostly dangers. Or, at the very least, Rachel could have spent more time with her emotionally disturbed son to both help his childhood development and, through his psychic connection, learn more about the content of Samara's character. You know, stuff that isn't included in sealed medical files or microfiche. Gen Z friends, ask your grandma about microfiche. But what would you do if you were in this situation? Would you tell your sister to hire a private investigator and spend the extra time with your emotionally disturbed child? Would you work your day job? Would you have watched the tape? Would you show the tape to your loved ones? Would you send a copy to a popular internet channel's Black Spine YouTube show? Let us know in the comments. And tell us which movie you want to see get the movie logic treatment next. See you next time at the movies.